Welcome to our review on power and paying for electricity. First thing we're going to look at then is the power rating of appliances. So no matter what electrical appliance you have in your home, then it has a power rating. And the way that this is worked out then is by using the calculation which we're going to find on page two of the exam booklet. So you don't have to memorize it, just remember page two, which is power in watts equals the voltage in volts times by the current in amps. So to give you an example of the kind of question they could ask you here, the main supply is 230 volts and the current used by the TV is 0.75 amps. What is the power of the TV? So turn to page two, find our calculation, power is voltage times current. Then we substitute in our numbers, voltage is 230, current 0.75, stick that into your calculator and that gives you your 172.5 watts as the power. If we're considering how much energy an appliance actually uses in a given time, then what we're looking at is something called the kilowatt hours or the units. Now, what we find is that the amount of energy that our appliance is going to use is going to depend on two things. First thing is the power of it. And the second thing is how long we're actually leaving it switched on for, which leads us very nicely into our second calculation. Again, found on page two of the exam booklet, so you don't have to memorize it. And the energy transfer in kilowatt hours is the power in kilowatts times by the time in hours. So to give you an example of a question here, the computer uses 0.25 kilowatts and is switched on for five hours. How much energy does it transfer? Flick back to page two, find your equation. So energy transferred is power times time. Substitute in your numbers. So power is 0.25, time is five. So 0.25 times five in your calculator gives you 1.25 kilowatt hours. The third calculation then flows very nicely from our second, and this is to work out the cost of the energy. So what you actually find is that in your home somewhere, you will have an electricity meter, and that is gonna be recording how much electricity you're actually using. And then the electricity company is gonna charge you by the unit. And the way that they actually do that is by using the calculation here, which is the cost is the energy transferred times by the cost per unit. So in the question, they will always tell you the cost per unit, etc. And then obviously you only need to work out the energy transferred, which we did previously. So to give you an example of the kind of question they could ask you here, a kettle uses 3.5 kilowatt hours of energy. The unit of electricity costs 10.2 pence. What is the cost of the energy transferred by the kettle? So all we do is 3.5 times 10.2, which gives us 35.7 pence. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that you could well have a question that's worth three marks that's going to be using this calculation and the one to calculate the energy transferred. So the general rule for calculations is if it's worth two marks, then it's only got one stage to it. If it's worth three marks, there's probably a second stage to it. So that means that you're using your answer from the first calculation in the second one, like we would here. Now, some people do have something called off-peak electricity. Now, all this tells us is that at certain points in the day or night, then the electricity will be cheaper to use. So it's called off-peak or sometimes economy seven. Now, if you have this, then you can take advantage of this cheaper period of electricity, and they usually put it in the awkward hours of the night. So you can obviously use that cheaper electricity to heat your homes or run appliances, etc. But the downside is you're going to have to have timers, unless obviously you've got a very dodgy sleep pattern and like being up at about three in the morning. So what we find is you're going to have to have timers to run the appliances, and not everything can actually be done at those off-peak times. Not many of us particularly want to start cooking our meals at three in the morning. So even though it is a way of reducing our electricity bills, it's not always practical. When we looked at the national grid, we mentioned this thing called a transformer. So what we actually find is that these transformers are very important in changing the voltage. So we've got two types. We can either have a step up transformer where we're going to increase the voltage, or we can have a step down transformer, which reduces the voltage. So what we actually find and the reason behind us using these transformers is that if we transmit electricity at a high voltage, we actually reduce the energy losses in the power lines. 
So by having a step up transformer outside our power station before it's transmitted, we're reducing the losses as it goes through all those power lines. We then obviously have to reduce the voltage at the other end before it gets into houses because playing with 400,000 volts of electricity in our homes is a touch dangerous and not many appliances would work with that. So what we actually find then is that when current flows through a wire, we get a heating effect. So that means that some of that electrical energy is then going to dissipate into the surroundings. So the larger the current, the more heat we produce and therefore the more energy we waste. However, if we increase the voltage, we decrease the current. So by having a higher voltage, we've reduced the current, we've reduced the heating effect on the wire, which means we've reduced the waste. When we're thinking about these power lines then that run all the way across the country, some of them go overhead and go between those big pylons, and others are actually underground. Now, we've got advantages and disadvantages of both. If we think about burying them underground, then obviously we don't have that visual impact. So it's not like you're looking across and you see these big pylons all over the place because some of these cables are buried underground, which negates the need for that. And we also reduce the risk of anything colliding with them because obviously if we've got big pylons, there is the risk that something could end up colliding with it, which is not very good news when we're talking about 400,000 volts, let's say. However, what we find is that it is actually more expensive to bury these cables underground because we've got to insulate them and waterproof them because hopefully we know that electricity and water is not a good mix. So we need to obviously ensure that they're well insulated and that they're waterproofed. And the other big problem is that if there is a problem with that power cable, then we're going to have to dig up the ground to actually be able to carry out the repairs. And that's obviously more problematic and more time consuming and obviously more costly.